for, for those of you who don't know me, uh, hi, I'm Molly Herford. I am, um, oh gosh, where do I start? Um, I'm kind of everything. Uh, I guess I'm primarily a cycling journalist and author. I've written a lot of different books about bikes. Um, I co-own The Consummate Athlete, which is a podcast and coaching company. I co-own that with my lovely husband, coach and kinesiologist, Peter Glassford. <laughs> who is here to, to help me kind of go through this presentation tonight. He's going to talk a little bit about some bike fit, some bike mechanic-y type stuff. Um, and we're, yeah, just going to have an awesome time sort of talking about how we're, how we're getting back outside this spring. And, um, oh, uh, yes, also side note, uh, this is being recorded. Um, we'll probably just have me and the, the uh, screen share on the recording. So don't worry about your face being on there, but just FYI, it is being recorded. Um, and yeah, before, before we get really rolling, just a huge thank you to the Ontario Cycling Association for putting this whole thing together. We have, uh, four webinars. So we have tonight, we have one on Red S on Thursday. Next week, we have my personal favorite, the guide to riding comfortable with all of your awkward and uncomfortable questions being answered. And then an awesome women's round table next Thursday. Um, so links to all of those are at ontariocycling.org. And yeah, we're super stoked on that. Peter, anything to add before we get rolling? Nope. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So our guide to getting outside. So as we sort of started thinking about this, I had a moment of wanting to make sure that we were talking to not just people who picked up cycling in the past year, although hopefully we have quite a few, uh, you know, new COVID cyclists, I think is what we're calling them on the call. Um, people who are hoping to get out this summer and, you know, who maybe haven't even had a lot of time to, to ride outside yet. Uh, but we also wanted to speak to those who have been outside riding for years. Um, so we're not just kind of talking about how to like literally get out the door and get on your bike. We're talking about this idea of creating routines and rituals around our riding. Uh, this is something that Peter and I have talked a lot about on our podcast and in the book we wrote last year. Um, we're pretty habitual with everything. And we've kind of realized Peter works with a ton of really time crunched people, right? Like we're not professional athletes. We only have so many hours in a week that we can train. So we really wanna make the most of those, those hours. And, you know, the, the time you get a, a flat tire and you forgot to bring a tube and now you have to call for a ride or, you know, when you're going to get dressed for a ride and you realize all of your shorts are in the laundry or your computer isn't charged um, or, you know, your, your tire is flat because you forgot to check it after a ride. All of these things can take our, you know, say eight hours we have a week to ride and really drop that down to, you know, five or six real quick. Uh, so we're sort of all about this idea of how, how can we make getting out on the bike easier, smoother, and safer too, and, and more fun. Like no one wants to be stuck on the side of the road uh, trying to change a flat only to realize that your patch kit is, you know, 15 years old, the glue is all dried and no longer is, is sticking and you have to, uh, you know, phone your, your partner for a ride. So... <laughs> all about the routines and rituals. Um, but before we get too deep into that, uh, just a few safety notes. Uh, the one, we actually had a few questions come in from people who registered uh, about uh, insurance and if the OCA offers it. Uh, I'll include a link when we, we've sort of gone out of this, but I just did an article actually for Ontario Cycling. You can find it on their website. Maybe Kim can actually drop it into the chat. Um, all about the insurance options with the OCA. It's actually amazing, guys. Yeah, like. I, I sound, I swear, I sound like a sponsored post yeah, you're whenever gonna be, you're going to be an insurance broker. I know so. whenever I talk about this, but your OCA membership has a $25 add on that gets you personal insurance for all of your training. So if you're out on a training ride solo and something happens, you have insurance for that. So uh, whether you already have your OCA, member, OCA membership or you haven't gotten it yet, definitely get that add on. It is so worth it. I like cannot stress that enough. Um, and in addition, if you are in club rides though, and it's OCA sponsored, then those are covered by this, uh, another insurance policy. So the club policy, yeah, yeah the club policy. So Kim has put that into the show notes. <laughs> oh God, sorry. The in, chat, into the chat, into the chat. Um, I'm very used to podcasting here. Uh, so definitely check that out. If you have been wondering about insurance. 
Um, the bike lights and bell. I just feel like I need to mention this because I also just did an article for the OCA about what cycling lawyers from Ontario want you to know. And I did not realize this, but legally in Ontario, you're obligated to have front and rear lights as well as a bell on your bike. Now, I will admit, I don't necessarily have them on all of my bikes, but I think it's worth noting that, you know, if you do get pulled over at any point and you don't have those, you could be ticketed. So it's worth pointing out. And I mean, it is a good safety feature. So yeah, worth, worth remembering. Um, it's that time of year where we want to check that our helmet is in good shape, uh, that it hasn't, you know, undergone any destructive stuff since you, you know, put it up in the attic when you like put it away for the winter. It hasn't like fallen off the shelf. Your dog hasn't started chewing away at it, all that kind of stuff. Just Give it a little once over, make sure it's still in good shape. Um, and because unfortunately right now we can't do group rides, like that is that is just where we are at in Ontario with the, the current lockdown policy, um, highly, highly recommend location sharing with a friend or a partner, just someone where you have your location shared on your phone just kind of constantly. Uh, that's something Peter and I have done for like almost a decade now. That way, when you're out, someone knows where you are. You know, it's it's just super important as we're doing a lot more solo riding, unfortunately, this season. Um, and that is that is our current COVID situation. There's no club rides. There's no group rides outside of your household. You know, hopefully, fingers crossed, soon that will be, you know, different. But right now, we're talking about riding alone. So as we as we are talking though, we're going to talk about group rides and riding. You know, in a pack and drafting and that kind of stuff. Um, but we do not mean go out and do that tomorrow. We're just letting you know for the future when we can do that again. Um, and Peter, do you want to talk about awareness? This yeah, is... I mean, I think it goes without saying, but I, I always think back to uh, like young drivers, you're learning to drive, right? And they talk about defensive driving. Uh, and, and indeed, when we're riding our bikes, especially in a city, but really anywhere, we want to be engaged, right? And it's easy to start zoning out or looking at our phones or looking at our devices, you know, seeing how many watts we're maybe pushing or how fast we're going. Uh, but the idea is the sort of that when we're switching from indoors where we're maybe watching a TV uh, or we can really zone out, we don't have to balance, we don't have to steer. Uh, outside it is, it's like a you're actually cultivating this like intense awareness and, and sort of really, uh, if you can engage with that, I think it's actually makes it even more of a flow state, even more of an enjoyable experience. Uh, but we're definitely doing this. How weird. Sorry okay. about that. We're I don't back. know what just happened. <laughs> so we're cultivating awareness. I was just very aware of this muted screen. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to, in mountain biking, we talk about now and next. So we're talking about where we are right now and then next, where are we going? So there's this active, we call it trail scanning, but if you're riding in the road, you're riding in the city, we're actively scanning and sort of asking what is next? What is next? What is next? Scanning for cars, scanning for intersections, scanning for what's that pedestrian and the, the dog off the leash doing, right? And it sounds like there's a lot of hazards, um, but if you can be active and, and, you know, this defensive driving, I think that's, that's the idea with this active scanning, this awareness when we're riding our bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually, uh, a while back, we had a Krav Maga expert on our podcast and he was talking about just like that, like constant vigilance. And I really, I really take that. It was a little intense. But it was it, super like, intense. He was like in the subway looking for people and stuff. Yeah. But I guess there you go. Yeah. And actually on the note of awareness, this is kind of a, a tangential aside, but one thing that we do every time we're, we're teaching a yoga class or I'm teaching a yoga class, my, my favorite thing to start every yoga class with is I do this one move and I'm just going to show it real quick is uh, you bring your like right arm up, you're just sitting cross-legged on the floor and then you bring it onto the mat behind you and you're looking over that right shoulder. Your left hand is on your right knee and you're just looking over and then you, you repeat it on the other side. And the reason I have everyone do that is because you know, we're pretty like one dimensional as cyclists. And I mean, as people who work on computers all day, it's pretty rare that we do really good looks over our, our head or over our shoulders. So it's super important to kind of build up that flexibility and the mobility to be able to 
look over your shoulders and check for traffic and sort of see what's what's going on. So that's that's been a huge, I'd say, advantage for for me lately being able to do that. Also great for racing because you can quick check who's behind you. All right, so that's our that's our safety. So before we get outside, we're gonna do a bike check. And I know this sounds really like irritating to think about doing this for every single ride, but again, I mean, if you've ever been on one of those rides where you're five minutes in and you're like chain just breaks or, you know, you just hear that of your tire going flat. We've actually been waking up in the middle of the night to Peter's tires not ceiling all the way. <laughs> it's like a ghost ceiling issue. Um, but you just want to keep your, your bikes kind of constantly checking them, constantly checking them, because if you can catch little things quickly uh, before they get really bad, you save a lot of money in repairs. And right now, bike shops are so slammed that like any repair at this point, they're like, it's going to be, you know, eight weeks. No. So we want to keep your bike in working order. Peter, do you want to just quickly roll through your sure. bike check? Yeah, maybe something, some new things here for some people who are experienced cyclists too. But the idea is we want the bike to roll. So I always start with the, the wheels, right? So we have the tires um, in mountain biking, but in you know most of the disciplines, we talk about apple, orange, banana. So with your tires, if, you're, if we're riding off-road, we're more we're looking for the, the sort of like sensation when we squeeze them that it's more like an orange, right? So there's a little bit of push to it, but it doesn't give out like maybe a banana if you tried to put your thumbs through it. There's a little bit of pressure there, but there's a little bit of give. Uh, on road, we're normally looking more for like an apple, a nice firm. You don't want that like mushy apple, right? It's like a firm apple. So tire pressure. So we're checking our tire pressure. You could also be more precise and use a gaze, uh, a gauge, a gauge. <laughs> I apologize. Um, and then we're looking also then when we think about wheels, we're thinking about are our wheels rolling. So if we have disc brakes, especially, sometimes you'll find that they end up, you know, dinging or something's gotten off. So we just give each wheel a spin. Um, and then the skewers, make sure that our wheels are attached. So a lot of times, actually, even with the new through axles, those, those axles, the axle nuts or the skewers, um, the quick release, they'll come, you know, they could be released by someone in your house or grab something or, or whatever, right? So we just want to make sure that those are tight because that's important that those wheels stay on. Um, so we have wheels spinning. Uh, brakes are checking. So usually what we'll do is we'll just grab those brakes, give them a good squeeze and try and move the bike back and forth. And the bike will almost like tip up and then tip onto the front wheel and you can just really give a quick check again brakes are important to check before we get rolling because we want them to to stop us from rolling so we'll do that check shifting is is typically okay but again if your bike falls over or something like that you could find that you're you're shifting into the spoke so if you can do some sort of quick check uh with your shifting that might even be as you're just getting going sort of running through the gears while you're going slowly uh and and that way you won't shift into the spokes going really quickly down the road uh, but if you had a stand, you could give it a quick run through, um, or if it's on the trainer or something like that too, you could definitely give it uh, a look at, as far as that. Um, and then the last thing is just that the handlebars are tight and really we want everything to be tight. This could be bags and stuff. So sometimes it's, I almost call it the bounce test. You just want to sort of like slam the bike around a bit, maybe try and, you know, turn the handlebars while holding the wheel between your legs and just make sure that it's tight. Uh, and that usually isn't an issue once you get started in the season. But again, when we're, we've just gotten the bike out of storage or we're getting off the trainer or you've had a bike fit or you've had you know any of these things, it's good to just sort of give that, that handlebar the good old like twist side to side just to make sure that the handlebar, right? And we're really just looking for these things that are, you know, we want to stop, we want the wheels to stay attached, we want the handlebars to stay attached. And if we can do that, we're usually in pretty good shape. Um, and then the last thing is really just now everything's charging, right? We have lights charging, we have Garmin's charging, our, our bike computers are charging, some of us might have shifting that's charging. Um, so there's just so much stuff that just needs to be constantly uh, charging. So again, this is where we get into Molly's rituals and routines, but making sure that we do have a regular sort of rhythm of that all gets plugged in when we come in the door or once a week we do, a, you know, on our off day, we, we plug it in. Uh, just to make sure that again when we go out and we want to use our lights or we need our lights coming home late for a commute or something like that that we have them yeah i've i've been at a couple of races this is typically like the paris Lancaster week uh in ontario here and i've i think every year that i've done it since electronic shifting has become a thing i will inevitably pass someone because their shifting has died because they forgot to charge it all winter and this is the first time their gravel bike has come out of the the garage so i mean it's a great feeling for me because that means I get to pass one more person, but not so great for them because then they're stuck in a terrible year. So definitely want to check on that. That will very quickly ruin your ride. 
Okay, the what to wear. Uh, this is a very intensive matrix, I realize. Um, feel free to, <laughs> to screenshot it if you want, um, because I, I spent a lot of time kind of trying to think through all of this stuff. Um, and really, this isn't necessarily the hard and fast rules for what to wear. Rather, this is sort of my checklist for what I'm going to wear in these situations. And I highly recommend that especially for the spring riding, everyone kind of make up their own what to wear matrix like this. So that way it really makes it easier to figure out what it is that you're going to like go out in. And it really like, you know, you go from that like 20 minutes of looking in your closet and like pulling out a vest and then you go outside and you're like, oh crap, I should have worn the jacket. So now you go inside and you get the jacket and you put it on and now it's raining. So now you're like, oh crap, I need to find the raincoat and the raincoat doesn't fit over the jacket. And oh geez, I forgot a base layer. So now I have to take everything off and now everything's off and everywhere. Uh, so having sort of your own little list of, okay, I can look at the temperature outside, see if it's sunny, see if it's raining. And I can very quickly know exactly what I'm going to put on. Just makes life so much easier, especially in these really awkward temperatures that we're in right now, where you know you can leave the house and it's two degrees, and then 20 minutes into the ride, it's somehow gone up to 18 and sunny. Um, so yeah, just being aware of the the weather and having sort of your system for what you want to wear. Springtime, big on the layers. I cannot stress layers enough as like the, the best thing. Peter, do you want to explain your plastic bag? Uh, oh, we can, yeah. I mean, I think this is really important, right? Again, your range might be slightly different. I, I really like this sort of zero degrees and 15 degrees of sort of break points between sort of the seasons. Um, and just it, it, as Molly says, it helps us get out the door, right? So it's like, no, it's below freezing. I'm going to wear long tights or, you know, it's, it's under 15 degrees. I'm going to cover my legs with leg warmers or knee warmers. And then over 15, I can feel a little more confident that I'm going to, you know, maybe have those bare legs. I, I don't get there very often personally, and you, you may get there sooner. It'll be July before he is going bare legs. But one thing I do use in spring weather, especially if I don't want to carry a, a bunch of jackets or a full vest or something, is I, I just, you can do it with newspaper as the classic, sort of just like the front of your jersey or your jacket, you just put... Uh, newspaper. I actually just really like like a garbage bag. Actually, it sounds ridiculous, but it just puts a windproof front onto your under your jersey or under your jacket. And then once you you'll inevitably start sweating and get warm, but then you just pull it. It's super easy to pull off and put in your pocket. Um, so yeah, I do that all the time. I, but I tend to be cold too. So <laughs> yeah, surprisingly like weird hack that works very well. It's very cheap. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, which is nice in cycling to have cheap things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I once interviewed Rebecca Roosh, the pro mountain biker, and she said anytime she goes on a mountain bike ride and the temperature is a little iffy, she actually packs um, a shower cap. Shower cap and then gloves, like... Uh, like surgeon's yeah. gloves. But they're in her, like, repair bag. Yeah, she just keeps them yeah. tucked in her saddlebag, so if it gets super cold, she puts the shower cap over her helmet and it instantly, like, warms up her head. Puts the gloves on under her gloves, so that way... Like or or over if it starts raining and she can do it fast enough, but that way she kind of has this extra layer of warmth in her fingers. So just kind of thinking about those like little ways that you can make your ride infinitely better if the weather does shift on you, because inevitably it's springtime, it's gonna shift on you. Surgical gloves also for if you have to do any you know work with your chain or chain oh, tires. True. It's also if you if you're not one who likes grease on your hands or on your kit <laughs> or, on or everywhere, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that's that. And I will add um, at the end, if anyone is interested, I can send this to anyone. So don't don't stress if, if that's like, like too much. Um, OK, so our next topic is fuel. And I mean, obviously, we could do an entire webinar on, you know, what to eat before, during and after a ride. But we don't really need to go too in depth on it. We just kind of wanted to speak to this idea of eating and drinking something during your rides. Now, if we're talking about a 60 minute ride, don't worry about it. You're gonna be fine. Have a water bottle in case it gets hot out and you know, you're feeling a little thirsty, but you're gonna get through a 60 minute ride just fine. But if you're getting over that hour threshold, you're gonna to wanna to start getting something in. So the general rule is around one water bottle an hour. You might be someone who drinks a lot. It's like a really salty sweater. You know, someone who just feels the need to hydrate more. So you might go a little bit more. You might go for like one of the big bottles instead of a little bottle. But generally aiming for that one bottle an hour and around 200 calories an hour. And again, totally varies based on the person, but we wanna start somewhere. 200 tends to be what most people can handle without feeling kind of disgusting. 
Uh, I'm sure everyone's had the moment of like bonk during a, a ride where you've crammed in a ton of food and then just inevitably felt like much worse for a while. We want to avoid that happening. Um, you know, the reason we're, we're saying this per hour is because we want to have slow and steady fueling. So we don't want to be chugging a bottle three hours in. We don't want to be, you know, eating like four Snickers bars or like sucking down like three gels or something like that because it's two and a half hours in and we're starting to feel that oh, bonk. Um, we want to be just having a little bit at a time, just nice slow drip. Um, and this is a huge skill. Um, a lot of people don't think about this, but man, I remember when I first started riding, the act of pedaling, keeping your eyes ahead, seeing what's going on and reaching down, getting out your bottle, taking a drink successfully, not getting it all over you, getting it back into the, the bottle cage. That's a lot of things all at once, especially if you're a newer cyclist. So while that's a huge skill to practice, it's also completely okay, especially, you know, as you're getting used to this, to just stop and take a couple sips, eat a few bites. Like it's much more important to adequately fuel yourself throughout this than it is to keep pedaling the entire time. Uh, you know, we've coached a lot of junior camps that have some of the top riders in Ontario and actually in Canada, and they take a lot of snack stops, I'll be honest. Like they can eat on the bike, but they really prefer to be stopped to, you know, get out whatever, you know, bar or gel they have in their back pocket. So you are not alone if you have to stop in order to, to you know, take anything in. Um, and this is something we could practice on the trainer too, by the way. Um, this is something a lot of people don't do when they're on the stationary bike in the winter, but it's such a good thing to practice while you're inside. Um, you know, instead of having your, your, you know, cup of water on the table next to you and your like tray of beautifully arranged snacks that are like right in front of you, you know what, wear a jersey so you can actually practice that, like picking your, your bars out, picking your gels out. Because that's, I mean, that's a pretty big mobility thing to be able to, to make that move while you're pedaling and you're bent over and you're rummaging and you've gotten the wrong one and you're putting it back and you're getting the other one out. Um, and, you know, the reach down, that's, the trainer's a great time to practice that. So we really want to be, you know, spending time practicing our fueling, not just in how much we drink, but just the act of getting our water out, getting our snacks out. I think that's good. Yeah. The, I, I think too, these rules of thumbs are a great place to start, right? It, it's, it's, you know, this idea, are you eating something each hour? Again, as Molly says, if you're, you know, riding in just an hour indoors or an hour spin or whatever, we, we don't need to eat. You're probably going to have breakfast. You're probably going to have lunch. Uh, around that right but that said you are allowed to eat if you didn't have breakfast and you get on the bike and you're hungry you know you're starting to feel a little weak you, you are allowed so sometimes it's like these rules get in the way you know of just common sense right so it's like if you hung if you're hungry eat um if you're starting to feel you know weak and, and fading you know eat, eat more uh and that's usually how we we start at these rules of thumb and then i'm saying rules of thumb <laughs> i think I, now we're right okay good you're right i'm just like catching myself here i'm duplicating um but, you know, we, and then we modify it for you. So if you, if you're starting to be like, oh, I feel too full, then maybe we switch what you're having. We add maybe a bit of more water, a little less fuel. If you are fading and you feel like you could eat more, then we can add a bit more to the next, the next ride. Right. And it really depends on how long you're going, how hard you're going um, and what, what the objective is, right. Of the riding you're doing. Yeah. So this is where I think new cyclists, especially tend to be kind of um, not nervous, but less inclined to start kind of recording a lot of information about their training. Uh, but actually, anytime, whether you're a new cyclist or you've been riding for years, it's so worth it if you're not totally sure of like what your particular how much to eat, how much to drink situation is. After every ride, you know, if you are logging it in Training Peaks or logging it on Strava or logging it anywhere, just take a second and in the notes or comments section, just write down what you ate and how you felt. And then you can kind of look back and be like, oh, yeah, when I had that flavor of gel, I thought I was going to vomit. But when I had that bar, it felt amazing or vice versa. I don't know. <laughs> it totally depends on the person. Uh, and having that, that recording you know, for a long amount of time, you're going to have so much good information and know exactly what works for you. I always like to call it like being a detective about yourself, uh, which makes it sound much more like Nancy Drew and much less lame. So be a detective about yourself. 
I think probably the last thing on that though is is also just as part of our routines where you know we're putting tools you know our allen keys and our, our pump and whatever you know maybe going in the left pocket and then always a bit of food that's going in the right pocket right and this is 30 minute spin you know this could be 60 minutes this could be a five hour thing and we're always just a little bit of food going in that pocket um, and if not for you it's for a friend right someone's having you know or, or you know the first aid situation if someone's diabetic or something it's just nice to have you know be prepared right so uh, I like that routine of just, I'm always, you know, putting a bit of food. I don't go, you know, jam my pocket for an hour ride, but I try and bring something and, you know, the same bar and gel probably come back and forth on many rides before they ever get used. But we said we had a power bar for eight years. <laughs> it never got used. We didn't need that. But, no, yeah. that one got thrown out. Uh, on that note, actually tools for the road. So if you've been riding mostly inside or what, oh, actually, uh, Jessica had a, a great point. Uh, she uses the hunger scale. That's super good for, I mean, even during your ride, thinking about where you're at with the hunger scale. And so like then, a one to 10, yeah. she's saying. Yeah, that's great. And yeah. then after the ride, like making note of that too. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and on that note, if you finish your ride and your head is going into the refrigerator, yeah, like- that's our rule. Can you take a shower before you have the snack? If not, you got you more. Yeah. <laughs> Sometime. Yeah. 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 <laughs> which I will get to <laughs> at the after ride section, which is like my hill that I will die on. We'll get there. Um, so tools for the road. So we can add a snack to this list, actually. Um, this is like what's kind of always in your saddlebag. Uh, so some kind of multi-tool. Um, we like ones that have chain breakers on them. It's very helpful. Um, it's even more helpful if you actually know how to use a chain breaker. A lot of this stuff, uh, when it comes to the, the fixing your bike on the fly, is best done in the, you know, quiet and calm of your own home before you're out on the road. I know for me, I did not know how to fix a flat until I sat in a garage and just fixed a flat like several times, just took the tire off, you know, changed the tube, put it back on and just did it over and over again. And then I was totally fine to do it on the road. But before that, I would not have touched my, I would have tried to find, I would have flagged down a motorist and be like, do you know how to change a bike tire? Uh, Oh yeah, and someone mentioned uh, tire levers are great, definitely. Uh, yeah, so learning how to do that is gonna make a huge difference uh, to, to your confidence on the bike. We always talk about confidence comes from competence. And, you know, competency doesn't just mean that you can ride for two hours and not get tired or that you can, you know, do a wheelie. It also means you can, you know, deal with if you have a flat and you're by yourself or, you know, your shifters are a little wonky and you're by yourself. Um, yeah. And Robin also added pumper cartridge. Excellent. Yeah, I should have. I this is like what I was thinking about for putting in my saddlebag that always stays. And I'm like, oh crap, I can't fit a pump in my saddlebag. So yes, add a pump for sure. Right. Um, so I always say tube end patches is my my thing too because I think you know you get one flat, great, you've got a tube, but after that you're you're kind of you're kind of effed if you uh, if you get another flat, which I feel like happens more often than we'd care to admit. Usually, like, if you get one flat on a ride, the odds of another flat are somehow higher. I don't know why. Well, it comes, I think, in the installation, but also if the spare is not a good spare. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely worth practicing. Like, this is, you know, right now we're a little restricted, but I always try and encourage in the winter, too, you know, you're inside. You could include that in, you know, as part of your training, right? And Molly's right that it's, it's so hugely, uh, when you actually do it for yourself on the road the first time, uh, hugely like a big self-confidence boost, right? And, and when we start thinking about the worst case scenarios for cyclists, like this is, you know, getting stranded, you know, being out in the forest all alone or something like that. Uh, so getting yourself out is, is definitely, and, and you can start ticking these off. You're not going to get them all today. Um, but if you have time over the next month, like look it up on YouTube and, and try it, right? Get an old wheel or a wheel you need to change the tires on anyhow. In worst case, you just have to get someone to do it for you. Uh, but definitely a skill that's, that's worth practicing and worth knowing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other one I like to add is a tampon, and this is for three reasons. Reason number one, you might need it personally. Reason number two, a friend might need it, and you could be someone's best friend for this. I always tell the story of uh, being at a training camp in Georgia, and I was out with a girl who had just gotten her all-new white team kit that day. She was so excited to take it out for a ride. We went out on this, like, six-hour adventure. We're in the middle of nowhere, and suddenly she's just like, Molly, do you have a tampon? I did not. Worst friend award right here. There was nowhere around us. By the time we got to a gas station, that kit was ruined. Nothing will get that out of an all white kit. So be someone's best friend 
bring a tampon in your saddlebag. You could save somebody's ride. Reason number three, it's actually a fantastic first aid thing. If someone smacks into something and they have a nosebleed, tampon, weirdly effective for stopping nosebleeds. So there you have it. Three reasons you should always carry a tampon with you. Uh, and then obviously nowadays we're talking about bringing a mask everywhere. I actually have one just in my, like, I always have one in my pocket, but I put one in my saddlebag too, because you never know when you're going to forget to put it in your bag. And then you really want to stop for, you know, a coffee or croissant or whatever. And suddenly you're like, oh no, I forgot it. And now you're that guy. So mask. It's nice if you can get really every bike, right? Like sometimes we think about what we're carrying on our person. And I think it's like redundancy is nice when we have tools and, and tubes, right? So if every bike has a tube that's appropriate for that bike, uh, cause they're all different sizes now, Very all important. sorts of different widths and, and wheel sizes. So that bike has its own tube. And then you have maybe a multi-tool, a small one, you know, we're talking about tire levers and these can probably get into, you know, a decent uh, saddle bag, right? Or an under bag uh, or a bar bag, if that's what you use maybe a frame pump, if you use a frame pump uh, to get a bigger pump. But then on your, in your jersey, you know, this is where you can have your favorite multi-tool, you know, the really shiny, fancy one. Uh, and maybe another spare, Everyone has spare that, inflator. Right? You probably don't need to carry a two, but you could, right? And just, this is where we're getting into these like duplications, right? Especially if it's a bigger ride and you're starting to get it a little further out. Uh, but as Molly said, you, the redundancy is nice in tubes and tools and CO2. Someone said CO2 cartridges in the comments there. It's, uh, yeah, everything fails. So it's nice to have redundancy. Womp, womp. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I have on there is just cash. I just like always having like five or 10 bucks on me. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but there are still places in Ontario where you're getting like way out where they don't take cards. So it's nice to have a few bucks on hand. Or, you know, if you flat and you need to buy a tube off another cyclist, you feel better when you can like give them five or 10 bucks for their tube. Also, you can boot the tire. Oh, well. and you can boot yeah. the tire. Forgot that. Yeah. If you get a big hole, you can put the, the dollar bill inside the tire. Yeah, that's advanced. Yeah, plot changing. that's like yeah, two hundred one. We're in the two hundred one. Yeah. All right. Um, so the other thing we really wanted to address here is common injuries and your bike fit. So this is something that, you know, kind of gets exacerbated on the long winters on the trainer. Um, you know, because we're on the trainer, our bike fit might have shifted a little bit. You know, the saddle can go down a tiny bit throughout the season. Or, you know, you're just getting back on a bike that you haven't ridden for a year. And I would say we tend to think of this bike fit thing as like a static thing that like we get our bike fit once and we're good to go forever. But, you know, if you, I mean, the biggest example is like, if you have a baby, but there's also like, if you've started taking a yoga class, if you've recently lost or gained weight, um, you know, if you had any kind of injury, like off the bike, uh, you know, if your lifestyle has changed, like there's so many reasons that our bike fit can no longer be serving us perfectly. So I think it's, it's always worth checking in on like, how does my bike fit feel right now? And how is that working for me? So we have sort of some of our, our common issues that, that we tend to hear about. And I'm going to have Peter sort of speak to where you would first look on your bike if you're having that issue. Yeah, and we'll just speak in generalities, I guess. But Molly's exactly right that, you know, even a long drive, you know, can sort of affect how high of a saddle you're, you're willing to take on, right? We all felt, you know, tight getting into the car or, you know, after the Zoom, we're all like sitting here. Um, so it's, you know... It's tough sometimes. So uh, well, the one thing I really like is taping your saddle, your seat post that is, um, just you know where it is with some electrical tape. It can be color match, no one will notice, which is nice if, if and when we go traveling again, if you have to pull that post out or if you're pulling it for maintenance or storage. Um, but it also lets you sort of trim it you know, up or down a couple mils. And, and we're often talking just like one or two millimeters that that saddle might wanna move. And you're allowed to change that, as Molly says. Sometimes we think like we got a professional bike fit, we can't change it at all. But if we do it in this more scientific sort of tracked way, it's not a big deal. You can always put it back two millimeters, right? So with that said, knee pain. Often we get outside riding, we start go doing our hills or start adding some mileage, putting a little more pressure on the pedals in our group rides. So the typical thing with cyclists is you're going to find front of knee pain is probably the, the most common. And that's sort of as we start climbing hills more. Um, it's usually the thing. So this is a, almost a training error more than a bike fit uh, error, but it, it could be corrected by raising the saddle. So usually front of knee pain, we're thinking either the saddle needs to go up about two mils to start. If it feels better, you can go another two mils, but scientific. There, there is some chance the saddle needs to come back in that case, but it's rare in my opinion that we see that. Uh, so I would start with the, the saddle height. 
uh, unless you were like a triathlete or something where we're really pushing how far that saddle goes ahead, or you're just someone who, again, has something with their knees already where that, that saddle just maybe needs to just inch back a little bit. Um, back of knee pain is less common, but usually back of knee pain would be the reverse. We start thinking about the saddle being too high. So if you're, if you, and you see this, sometimes someone's newer to cycling or they've just, you know, someone's, their husband's come and raise their saddle so he could ride it. And then they've gotten it on the group ride and they're like tippy toe to try and pedal through the pedal stroke, right? And their legs extending. Um, so in that case, we would lower the saddle. Uh, it's also possible that it could come forward. But again, I think probably for back of knee, your first thing is to just lower the saddle two mils and, and see if it feels better. Uh, if we get into any of the back stuff, uh, that could be the handlebars being maybe a bit too low relative to the saddle for what you can handle. Um, there could be a, a host of reasons we end up with this. And a lot of this could be training just to, again, it's just our first rides where we've been hunched over, you know, for three hours now on our long ride instead of an hour on the trainer. Uh, and maybe on out on the road, we're actually staying on the bars versus maybe on the trainer, we were sitting up and taking back breaks every two minutes, you know, and we weren't staying on the bars. So th this is some of the thing. And we talked about that awareness where we have to be actually looking up, whereas on the trainer, we can just be like suffering and like, you know, looking at our Garmin and never actually having to look up. So we can end up with, with uh, different types of back pain, certainly neck pain, back pain because of that. Uh, lower back, you could end up with, and this could get into glute if we're sort of approaching that hip, you know, low back into our butt. Um, this could be a host of things again. Uh, this could be, again, too low of a saddle maybe, you know, just sort of too hunched over and we're really rounding through that back. It could be a lot of pressure or mountain bikers as they get into their first races or first real hard group rides off road, they're moving around so much. It's like their core isn't quite ready for it. Uh, so again, that might just be adaptation, right? And just pulling it back a level uh, or, you know, not quite as long a ride, not quite as hard a ride, a bit more mountain biking in preparation for the next race. Uh, glute, if I get into glute, so this, I might even call this hip pain, right? And sometimes we get this, if the angle of the hip, we're, we're sort of closing at the hip, if we think about sort of where we're sort of bent over this angle here, right? Some of us can't handle quite as much. So this could get into our, our, our handlebar drop. Sometimes on the road, we want to be really aerodynamic. Uh, and it's okay. Sometimes the bars are better to come up if we're, you know, we don't need to be super aerodynamic. We want to be pain-free and also be able to put in a lot of power. And what else with hip pain? Uh, sometimes a forward saddle will help with that too. Um, I had another thing on glutes though. Hips. Sometimes a different saddle. Well, if we were talking about more like butt pain, <laughs> for sure. Um, or sometimes, yeah, that's a good point too. Sometimes the saddle isn't comfortable. So we're, we're moving our hips in a way we don't want to because the, the seat's, you know, not comfortable. So we're trying to protect ourselves by, you know, rotating so our rotate pelvis off. Back, so we yeah. see that actually a fair bit. And then by getting a saddle that's more comfortable and lets you round, you know, your, put your pelvis the way you want to, uh, some of that hip pain, glute pain might, might resolve for sure. That's a great point. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, foot. So we're looking at our shoe and our pedal. Probably the most common thing we get is like a numb foot. And that's sometimes with a cleat, if we're using clipless pedals, just where that cleat is on the shoe and it's sort of pressuring onto soft tissue or just the wrong part of the shoe. I don't, I don't overthink that. I just say, probably just move the cleat back if you can. Uh, if you're already at the back, then move it forward a bit. But when in doubt, just move the cleat back. Um, and usually that corrects itself with the numb foot. But it could be, again, a shoe that's too tight, too small. Uh, Which I think is super common, especially in women's shoes. They tend to be super, super narrow, especially for road shoes. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to like let them be a little looser or, you know, we've had a lot of people and I do this myself, I switched to just mountain bike shoes and that's all I use and it's much more comfortable. Uh, really great if you're any kind of like runner or you want to do any kind of cyclocross or anything like that. Uh, it's just much easier to get used to the mountain bike shoes. And no one can tell the difference anymore. Mountain bike shoes look just like road shoes. It's fine. Uh, just they're more comfy. Um, so yeah, I think all of that to say, if anyone's like eyes are glazing over, they're like, oh my gosh, there's so much wrong with me and my bike. Oh no. Well, hopefully all those things aren't wrong. <laughs> hopefully all those things aren't wrong. Uh, this is really just to say that like you can make changes to your bike fit and you can try different things, you know, really up, down, forward and back is sort of the, the two ways to, you know, move around your, your saddle. And that's going to, you know, make a change for most of our stuff. Um, oh, um, so I will answer that in two seconds. Yes. Um, so yeah, it, it's just a good idea to be able to be willing to play with your bike fit and try to figure out what the heck is going on. And, you know, you might go back to where it was before and that's fine, but at least you'll know. 
And most clubs, you know, if there's a local coach or, you know, bike fitting is hard to get right now, but in normal times, you know, most shops are doing some sort of bike fitting or sizing even. Um, but you can also look up on the internet and, you know, a lot of us are pretty, you know, we're, we're pretty similar in that, like, you know, if your leg doesn't go completely straight, it's sort of just back from straight and you're not too hunched over, you're going to be okay on the bike. So you could probably do your own fit pretty nicely if you set yourself up on a trainer and just sort of look up some ideas, right? Um, or get a friend to help you out. Um, a lot of us start there mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. Uh, all right. Awesome. Before we move to the next thing, uh, Samina asked, uh, she's not affiliated with any group. Can she get individual insurance? So yes, with an OCA membership, you can. And the OCA membership, I think, starts like in the like $50 to $60 range. And then it's $25 for the add-on for cycling insurance. So it's cheaper than any other like cycling insurance policy that you could possibly buy that isn't, uh, isn't affiliated with anything. Uh, so I think Kim actually included a link to that. If you just scroll up in the chat, so you can see that. All right pre-ride mobility. So a couple of people asked about this in the questions for this talk, and it's one of like my favorite things to talk about because I am a huge fan that five minutes of stretching or yoga or whatever you want to call it makes a huge impact. Um, and a lot of people kind of just poo-poo it because it's like, ah, oh, five minutes, whatever. But my favorite thing to do is be like, well, five minutes a day, seven days a week, that's 35 minutes, which ends up being two hours a month, which is 24 hours a year of mobility if we just spend five minutes a day. Like that's 24 hours of training, that's pretty sweet. So pre-ride mobility, five minutes can make a huge impact. Um, so as far as our pre-ride stretches, we're not thinking about you know these static stretches and static holds where we're like in forward fold or anything like that. We wanna think dynamic, moving around. Um, actually, weirdly enough, I would say my biggest thing would actually be if, if you're, you know, doing the typing thing all day and you're hunched over a computer and you're about to then hunt yourself over a bike for, you know, another 90 minutes. I would honestly focus on really opening up your chest, you know, whether it's just some like arm swings, like arm circles, that's a huge win. Just letting that chest open up, letting your back open up, letting that stretch, some walking lunges, you know, literally just walking back and forth in the house, just really leaning into them dropping down, sort of feeling into your hips, you know, taking your time with that kind of stuff, just shifting around, seeing how things feel, um, just letting stuff kind of open up very naturally. It does not need to be a big production, does not need to be a huge deal. Um, just literally anything is going to be better than nothing in this case. I love just a few sun salutations. So where you're just like standing up straight, your arms go over your head, come down into your forward fold, you walk down into your plank, you walk it back up, repeat a couple times. We're just getting some movement going. We're just uh, lubing the chain, so to speak. Like if you picture the chain as your spinal cord, that's what we're trying to do with this, this pre-ride mobility. We don't need to get too like hyper intensive about it. Just move around a little bit. Do you have any favorites you would add there? No, I mean, I think the image that you have there is sort of demonstrating that lunge and arms overhead. And, you know, again, as while we're all seated at the keyboards, um, you know, these are the two movements, right? There are arms as cyclists rarely go over our head. Uh, so it's good to just open up that shoulder. Uh, and then also that lunge, you know, again, just to try and get things a little bit more open uh, for when we do get on that bike. And I think the idea is, you know, we're trying to get activated, right? And trying to get warmed up a little bit uh, before we get on the bike. We can, you know, the warm up, just easing into the ride. Sometimes we see, especially with the online stuff, you know, it's, we're going from keyboard to bicycle and, you know, it's it just all of a sudden we're just going as hard as we can. So I think part of this, you know, the mobility is helpful just to sort of get, you know, opened up so we're not feeling so cramped up. Uh, and then I think the other thing is just easing into stuff, um, especially if we're indoors, right? Try and resist the urge to just go from zero to, you know, racing. Well, heck, especially outdoors, when when group rides do come back, I think the huge tendency there, especially if you're if you're a newer rider and the group rolls out. I remember when I was new, like, man, when the group rolled out, that was like my like start line. I was on the rivet trying to keep up with everybody. So if you are new, if you get to the ride just like a little early, so you have time, just maybe roll around the parking lot a little bit and just kind of get yourself a little warmed up and ready to roll. That's, that's going to be, you know, just so much easier than just having your heart rate spike up because everyone started rolling. All right, skills practice. So this is actually where the kind of group riding kind of stuff comes in. I know a lot of people on here are, you know, hoping to mountain bike more this summer. I know a lot of people are, you know, riding with uh, clubs on the road. 
Um, and all of all of riding has skills. Um, we tend to think of skills as this thing that only mountain bikers need to practice, you know, because we picture like, oh, I'm going to hop this massive log or like go down this massive, you know, rock wall or whatever. Um, but like I said, even when we were talking about eating and drinking, like getting your water bottle out and drinking is a huge skill. Uh, you know, being able to handle if your road bike suddenly is like kind of slightly off the road and into the gravel and like, oh, geez, I got to get back on the road. Uh, that's a huge skill. Cornering is a really important skill. Breaking, also a good skill. <laughs> and of course, riding, you know, in the draft with people is a really important skill. And not a lot of uh, places really focus on that or teach that. So I think, you know, right now while we kind of have time, uh, spending a few minutes on skills, whatever they may be during every ride is something like I'm, I'm a huge fan of, and it makes such a big difference. And someone had asked actually about um, if a lot of riders like on here, especially newer riders would be clipping in. So, you know, running clipless pedals. Um, and I'd say like the bulk of group, like group club rides, unless you're going for one that's really, really beginner friendly, most of them are going to be clipping in. You totally don't have to, especially on a beginner ride don't like stress it. But again, this is a skill that we can practice, uh, you know, especially if you've been indoor riding and you have the option to do clipless pedals inside and play with that on the trainer. Um, even during the winter when we're on the trainer, we'll both practice just clipping out, clipping in, clipping out, clipping in, like try to do it like 10, 15 times each ride. Uh, just so that way when we do get back outside, it's much smoother. Uh, it's, you know, not the easiest skill to learn. It takes a long time to, to get it right. And there's a reason that even at world championships, there's at least one guy who's going to miss his pedal in the start. Yeah. And I mean, I wouldn't rush to use them if you don't have to. I mean, I think you you, you will see it for sure in group road rides. Um, and here on, in the east of, of North America, we see a lot of clipless pedals. At west, it's, it's actually not as common because mountain biking and, and off-road is more common sure. uh, and road less so. Um, but it's sort of, they're both good, but I wouldn't, if you have an opportunity to use flat pedals, it's, it's one of the best teachers you have for, you know, slow speed skills, for learning to push into the bike. If you are thinking about bunny hops, uh, things like corners and getting a foot out, if we are going to crash, it really grooves a lot of that. And, and one of the tests we always say is if like, if you are concerned about falling over or, or you keep saying, I, I'm not getting clipped in, I didn't get clipped in. Um, that's usually a good sign that we need to spend more time on the flat pedals to sort of get those uh, baseline balance skills. Uh, groove. So this might just be on your commuter bike, or maybe you have a mountain bike, you can keep those flat pedals on. But I think it's great. You know, I try and keep a bike all the time that has them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, it could be a commuter, or it could be, again, a skills bike. Some of the, my clients who are, you know, full on racing, will have a, a skills mountain bike that they then go out and ride. Yeah. And I would say just kind of coming back to, to skills practice in general, I spent probably the first like six or seven years when I was riding as the world's worst cornerer, person for cornering, person at cornering, person who corners, just, just terrible. Um, and it cost me so much time, whether you're talking about like racing or group rides or whatever, as soon as there was a corner, I was just off the back and like chasing so hard. So I had to do so much more work than I would have had to if I had just taken five minutes a day to practice the art of cornering. Uh, so I feel like I lost years of my cycling life. Um, and probably so many positions in so many races where I could have done better because I just would not take the time to practice the skills. So the earlier you can start like actually practicing skills, and there's so many videos online. Uh, we have a ton over at consummate athlete, we, uh, consummate We actually just said we're doing a skills challenge for the next uh, 30 days where we're trying to get everyone to practice bike skills for just 10 minutes a day, every day, whether it's, you know, cornering or log hopping or whatever. Um, so I feel like that's something we should probably just do year round. Um, for sure. Yeah. And that could be on the trainer or, you know, track standing in on your deck or something like that too, whatever you feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. um, Jet and Ruby, good to see you. Um, and they, they said, you know, grassy field is, is a big place that we practice skills, right. And, and the reason is that when you fall over, it's not usually a big deal. Um, so definitely if you are working on any of these things, you want to learn to corner or you're just learning clipless pedals, definitely that's, that's the time that, or the place rather. Um, to do that. And I'm not saying that golf courses are closed right now or anything. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for that, but... that fast rolling grass. <laughs> just, just saying. 
Okay, the next big thing for our outdoor rides is standing up. This is one of the many hills I'm willing to die on, but standing up, not just because we're climbing or because we've gotten into like, you know, we need to go really hard, but standing up just every few minutes is so good for us for a few reasons. The first is that it gets our blood flow back. If you have numb feet or numb nether regions or numb hands, standing up is just going to shift everything so you can get that circulation back, even on your hands. If you think about, you know, if you're down like this the whole time, when you stand up, your arms straighten a little, you're getting a little more blood flow back. You know, you're lifting your, your butt off. So now we're getting a little more blood flow back into our butt. It's traveling down our legs. So good for us. It's super helpful with avoiding saddle sore issues because when we stand up, and we sit back down, we are no longer sitting on the exact same tissue that we were sitting on before. Like, obviously, we're sitting very close to it, but it's not exactly the same. We're moving, you know, just a millimeter or two. And that could be the difference between chafing something terribly or, you know, just kind of having everything sort of spread out. So hugely, hugely important. Just stand up every few minutes. And it's something that's a little scary to do, you know, when you're first out riding. And it's something that we don't think about doing when we've been riding for a really long time. Uh, so yeah, it's just like the best tip I could possibly get. And as far as like skills, this, this sounds like it's not a skill, but it's actually something, if, even if you watch high, high level uh, racers, there's, there's still racers that aren't very good at this. Uh, and, and if you look at the critical moments in racing or group rides, right, we're talking critical moments of where you might get dropped or where you drop people, um, you know, standing, you know, we're standing to start a race. Usually the people who are off the front, you know, just going for it, they're going to be standing, right? The people at the end of the race, when they're sprinting to win the Tour de France, they are, they are standing, right? And when, you know, Molly's attacking up this gravel hill on the slide, right? She's climbing. And this is one of the most common questions people have is how do I get better at climbing? And it, it's not that you stand all the time, but you have that option. And I would say it's, it's like a different set of muscles. It's all your muscles because your arms are working and they're pulling and you're putting all your body weight on one pedal. You can see Molly stomping down on her right pedal and she's about to stomp onto that left pedal and flop the bike over, right? So you're really leveraging all your body weight, your upper body muscles, and then you're just stomping with those strong lower body muscles, right? So this is how we get stomped up some of these big steep climbs or just go faster is, is by harnessing the skill of standing. But it doesn't need to be a big strong move. You can also just stand up a little bit and move your butt. You know, well, it could be sub Give it a little wiggle. It could be submaximal attacks too. We don't always have to attack full <laughs> gas. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. And then sort of the, the final thing during your ride is not to stress a bad workout. So I don't know how many people here have uh, had the experience of they've been on the indoor trainer all winter, riding away on Zwift and having very specific workouts sets that they're doing where they have like very specific power numbers they want to hit and very specific time for things and like the perfect uh, hill um, or perfect stretch of road. And then we get outside and suddenly the hill is not uh well you're in an alleyway you're yeah, right yeah. <laughs> the, the hill is not there you're stuck in an alley um as for this picture uh you know the, there's a stop sign you hit a red light there's a billion things that can go wrong when we're outside riding but i mean ultimately like we were on the trainer in order to get to the outside thing so it's much better to have a slightly imperfect workout that the hill was not quite five minutes it was like four and a half and you were supposed to do a five minute hill doing the hill outside is better every time. So don't stress. And that's a skill workout. too, right? It comes with time, right? It's, I saw someone, one of the pros um, posted like their intervals and someone said, oh, it looks like you're on erg mode. And they're like, well, I've been practicing a long time, but they were outside. And what they meant was that the, the intervals were like these nice tabletop intervals. You could like, anyone here could look at it and be, oh, he did, you know, four eight minute intervals. Um, and so it does come with practice, right? And some of that is navigation and learning routes, learning what workouts are even possible, right? And this is all a skill, navigation and following maps, planning routes, um, you know, just knowing where you are. And then also just that executing the thing with all these variables. When I'm talking about this awareness of the surroundings and the dogs and the, you know, people and the, you know, in the cities, it's just crazy, but people do a great job of it. And it just takes going out there and trying it, right? Just as you try your workouts, right? You're practicing. Perfect. Okay. And then we're, we're almost done here, but post ride, this is the hill I'm going to die on. When you're done with your ride, the first thing we're going to do is take our chamois off. Um, 
And if you are uh, if you are interested in learning more about this, I'm doing a whole talk on this next Monday at 7 p.m. So please join me for that. But generally speaking, we want to be Donald Duck after our rides. We want our chamois off. We want to let everything breathe. You know, we want to run through the shower. But even if we're at the mountain bike trailhead, I mean, don't get in your car with no pants. Switch your pants. Um, Maxi skirts are great for this, but please just take your chamois off. Don't sit around in a sweaty, gross chamois. Uh, then we want to have our snacks, but we want to be able to, you know, have our shower, relax, and then have our, our nice little post-ride snack or meal or whatever. Um, but we do, you know, we want to have our, our protein and our carbs and all that. You know, it is important, especially if we're planning on doing a big ride the next day to refuel after, you know, a long effort. Um, I put notes here because I also am a firm believer in taking notes. So this is after your ride is the best time to comment on how your ride went because you remember it. Uh, it's a lot harder to make notes on, you know, what you ate, how you felt, how your intervals went or how anything went. If it's like three days from now and you're trying to remember to log it somewhere. Um, so whether that's uploading the ride and making a couple notes or writing it in your training journal. And again, it does not matter how new you are. Like if you're just logging 30 minute easy ride, felt great, that's awesome. Like start there, that's fantastic. You don't need to be a super pro to be recording your rides. You'll be really excited to be able to look back on this later. Uh, the bike check reset, just make sure, you know, your tires are not flat. Uh, I feel like it happens really often that you roll in the door and like suddenly you have a flat tire. Well, I wish that for everyone, that that's how convenient your life is. <laughs> I don't know if it always happens. I feel like it happens more often than you, you would expect. Possible, I guess. Um, but yes, quickly just checking over your bike, you know, making sure everything is, is clean. Uh, a wet bike, that's the best time to clean your bike. So if you are riding in these spring rains uh, while your bike is still wet, that's the best time to quickly wash it down. Otherwise the mud will cake on and it will be there forever. It is so much more work, <laughs> so much more work. Uh, and then reset. So by that, I mean, plug in whatever needs to be plugged in, uh, whether it's your bike or your computer or any of that, you know, try to put your kit in the wash, spray that down if it's super muddy, you know, put everything back in its place. So that way, next time when you ride, you're not like, oh crap, where's my multi-tool? And now you're going through drawers and trying to figure stuff out. Having those places that stuff goes back after your ride is gonna make everything so much faster and speedier for next time. And then quickie stretch. Um, my biggest favorite thing to do after a ride is just drop on the ground in my nice pigeon pose. So that's the one where your your uh, one knee is up next to your hands, uh, your other leg is stretched out behind you. It's a really nice hip opener. It's super lazy. It's fantastic. It's also a great low back stretch if you keep your hands up or you can let them walk down to your elbows, walk out. Um, Really any stretch that makes you feel good, it could be a few minutes of foam rolling. You might even find that just laying on your back on the ground in more of your like Shavasana corpse pose is just really helping you just kind of undo some of that hunched overness that we get from being on the bike. But taking a second to just check in with your body and see like, where am I at? How am I feeling? Like, ah. And that could definitely be, you know, if we're time limited, we're going right onto a Zoom meeting. Um, if you don't have to be the person talking, or maybe if you do, it depends on the setting, but you could definitely just set the goal to sit on the floor, right? And have that laptop on the coffee table. And when we sit on the floor, it's not super comfortable. So you're going to be shifting around and you, you'll start stretching, but sometimes the goal of just like getting on the floor is, is a good one, right? And then we start opening up these hips and, and doing these things that might be, might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The phone call meeting post ride is definitely a good one. If you want to be stretching while you're doing the call. <laughs> Cool. So that actually, oh my gosh, I am so, I'm high-fiving myself for the fact that it is 8 p.m. and I am at the last slide here. Um, so uh, that is that is sort of our guide to getting back outside riding. Um, you can find us over at consummateathlete.com. Kim put a bunch of those links to ontariocycling.org in the the chat, not the show notes. Um, but I'm also going to just drop, we have a newsletter for consummate athlete. I'm going to just drop this into the chat. And if anyone signs up for it, uh, like say in the next uh, 24 hours, I'm going to send out sort of a link, like all of the links from this and like videos and past webinars that we've done with the OCA for like yoga and stuff like that. So if you want to get on that, go ahead and get on that. Uh, Lily just asked, what is a consummate athlete? So uh, consummate athlete is, so uh, consummate means to kind of, just kind of be like 
good at everything. So if you're a consummate gentleman, it means you're like the perfect gentleman, the the one who can like show up and like play a hand of poker, but then also choose like the perfect whiskey and like pick the right cigar, but then also like speak uh, Japanese to the, the businessman over here and, you know, compliment the queen with like the exact right compliment or something. I realize I'm going really deep on this gentleman comparison, uh, but our idea of a consummate athlete is just an athlete who's a really good all around athlete. So someone who can, you know, not just ride a bike, but then also, you know, go out for a hike on the weekend or pop into a yoga class and have a good time. And who cares about kind of living this like healthy, holistic life where, you know, you want to be active and adventurous, but you also want to have a really good quality of of life outside of our sport. Uh, so yeah, being just kind of a, a good all around, happy, healthy, adventurous human being. <laughs> so a very long winded answer to that, sorry. <laughs> cool, um, does anyone have any other questions or Kim, if you have anything to, to add to wrap this up? Um, I will actually, the other link I was gonna drop in here is to I think next week's, um, that is not it. Um, if you head to ontariocycling.org, there's another couple of webinars coming up, including the Ride Happy, Ride Comfortable one next Monday. That one's going to be super fun. I'm really excited for that. And Thursday, this Thursday, is one on Red S, which is less fun, but very important. <laughs> so, I mean, Alex is real fun. So it's yeah, worth coming for Alex. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Alexandra Coates is our expert presenter with me on Thursday, and we're going to talk all about relative energy deficiency in sport. It's going to be awesome, wild ride. Um, yeah, and thank you all so much for coming out tonight. This is super cool. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of you, all of you on the roads and at OCA events and everything as things, you know, slowly get back to normal and we can get outside and ride together again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just from the OCA, I just want to say thank you to Molly and Peter for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for coming in on tonight. Yes, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for the awesome questions. And yes, hopefully we will see you all uh, later this week. Cool. All right. Bye, Good everybody. Night, night guys. <laughs>